All right. Here we go. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our forum. I am Laura Dixon with Spurs Sports and Entertainment, and this year I serve as the Lyceum president. It is 4.01 Central Standard Time on Thursday, April the 2nd. And this forum is for Texas Lyceum directors, alumni, and friends to gain perspective on our K through 12 education system during the time of coronavirus disruption. Um, it's great to see that um, so many are tuned in today. And um, if you want to learn more about the Lyceum, just visit texaslyceum.org. We have one hour for our forum today. So I'm gonna turn it over to our exceptional moderator, Zach Brady, and he can take it away. Thank you, Laura. And on behalf of everyone on the call, thank you for beginning by reminding us of the day and date. I think all of us are having a hard time keeping up with what day it actually is these days. Things are running together in these interesting times. We are joined today by three experts in the field of public education, um, specifically folks with expertise in Texas as well as across the country. Um, Margaret Spellings is with us. We're also very pleased to have Dr. Michael Hinojosa, the superintendent of Dallas ISD, and Bobby Blunt, a 20-year trustee at the Northside District in San Antonio. All three of our panelists today are alumni of the Texas Lyceum, and it's a, it's a pleasure for me and I know for all of us to get to hear from folks who have been part of our ranks and uh, to visit about these challenges. Secretary Spellings, um, I'd like to start with you. Obviously, you have decades of experience in the field, um, four years as Secretary of Education, past president, of the University of North Carolina system. And I know that you've seen some really kind of unexpected, unforeseeable crises in your time in public service. And take a minute and talk about how those instances, whether it be Katrina for as a, obviously a, an analog, how those affect um, public education perhaps differently or more severely than the rest of society. Thanks, Zach, and thanks to my fellow panelists, all of whom are on the front lines uh, of these challenges today, two school board members and a superintendent. So uh, you all are doing the really tough work and it's terrific to be on this seminar. I know we're all getting a bunch of memes, some of which are clean, some not so clean. And I got one yesterday that said, saw my neighbor Tammy out early this morning scraping the my kid is a terrific student off her minivan. Guess the first week of homeschooling didn't go so well. And it's a funny reminder of how important our schools are to our own lives, to our communities. They're places for supportive and safe learning. They're, they allow parents to work. They're places of friendship for adults and children meals for children, and on and on and on. So for starters, it's a good reminder of what American public education means to our life as Americans and how important it is and how uh, these routines that are getting interrupted really throw us all out of whack. Um, while these days are extremely challenging with very serious economic and health consequences for our state and country, there will also be improvements and innovation, and I can reflect on some of the learnings that I had in my days of service uh, that will come from this. And we'll, we'll, we're seeing a lot of that innovation now in Texas and around the country. But the crisis is also revealing inequities in our system that maybe were a little bit hidden before this, and they're now coming in plain view. When you see that families do not have food, kids cannot access learning because uh, they don't have access to broadband or technology and whatnot, and I know Michael will speak to that. Uh, as everyone knows, our, our Texas schools are closed and we've lar largely turned to online learning. This crisis, I think, will help us leapfrog on those fronts, uh, which in some cases we've been reluctant to do for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is broadband capacity, resources, the ability of teachers to deliver learning in that way. 
Uh, but we're also seeing our service providers step up and places like Nat Geo and the Smithsonian, as well as our traditional curriculum providers, provide products for parents and teachers, and that's good. We're learn gonna learn a lot from this experiment. Uh, the crisis, of course, is also provoking a lot of policy issues for nerds like us. You school board members are dealing with it, issues of assessment and grading and admissions and due process and, and personnel evaluations, governance and operations. And we'll, I suspect we'll get into to some of that. Uh, I'm reflecting on Katrina and, and that was a test for Texas too, where we really stepped up to the challenge as a state. Most of those students uh, that were dislocated uh, from New Orleans and from Louisiana did arrive in our state and we went through, and I know Michael can speak to this as well too, a lot of challenges getting those kids on track. And when you think about it, this is just a big uh, broad scale dislocation of students. Uh, physical plant is not at risk, uh, at least yet at the moment. Uh, but there's certainly a lot of lessons to be learned from, from that experience. Um, one is we have to understand where our students are. Uh, in terms of academic preparedness or lack of. Uh, that's why we need an assessment. That's why we need teacher grades and the like. Uh, we also need to understand where families are and how they look to their schools for support as well as for learning. So I'll, I'll pause there and uh, thank you, Zach, for moderating this, uh, this forum. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Dr. Michael Hinojosa is perhaps a more of a glutton for punishment than anyone else on this call, because he is serving not his first, but his second term as superintendent of the Dallas ISD, one of our state's obviously largest, most diverse, and historically toughest jobs um, in public education. Um, Dr. Hinojosa, first of all, welcome. And uh, I would like for you to begin by telling us a little bit about what's going on in DISD, with a, with a special um, focus on how partnering with state government and TEA has gone so far and what lessons perhaps we've already learned. Well, thanks, Zach. And I also want to thank the panelists. Uh, I've known both of them for many, many years as we've served uh, Texas for a long time. Um, yeah, and I want to talk about three major buckets um, quickly. Um, but first of all, I want to describe our students and Secretary Spellings is exactly right. In Dallas, we have a very diverse student population, but we're kind of a tale of two cities. People don't realize that we have 92% economically disadvantaged. We have 45% English learners. We have more English learners than Frisco has students, than Fort Worth has students, than Austin has students. And 46%, um, that's one of the largest percentages in the entire country. And then we have students from all over the world because we have several refugee centers here. Um, but we never apologize for our demography. We're proud of our students and we're proud to bring them things that they need. Um, and so to set up the context of how we've handled this situation, the, the three big buckets I'm gonna talk about is, uh, first of all, um, I, our feeding of our students. And then I wanna talk about our at-home learning. And then I wanna talk about the senior class and what they're facing on graduation. So those are the three things and I'll speed through those so that we can get to the other panelists. But first of all, I just described that 92% of or we have on our turnaround campuses, we actually feed students three times a day um, on our ACE campuses, Accelerating Campus uh, uh, Excellence. Um, and so therefore, knowing that our food, students depend on food from us so, so, so much, it was the first thing that we mobilized. Uh, we do have a very strong food service department and we had to figure out how we uh, get the food to the students as quickly as we can. Um, and so we um, organized that out. Initially, we started by going twice a week, but then actually even as many, we have 20,000 employees. And even with the 20,000 employees, one of the biggest, we, with the fear that's going around when every time the county judge or the governor or the, or the federal government says something, that strikes more fear to the hearts of our employees. So. Uh, we had to figure out a way to redeploy our services in a, in a shorter way. So we've actually gone to meal services for once a week starting next week, but we'll give meals for the whole week for all of those families. The number of families that have come out has overwhelmed us uh, to show us what the need is. The second 
bucket. And by the way, as you mentioned, the state has been very helpful. Commissioner Morat has been having daily conferences with all superintendents. It was Monday through uh, Sunday through Saturday at three o'clock every day. It helped me. Uh, I've been a superintendent for 25 years, but it also helps get good intel on when you're making decisions. And so a lot of the decisions that I might have made, I pivoted because uh, we had such good communication from the Commissioner of Education. I also am an officer on the Council of the Great City Schools, and so I had other conferences with national superintendents, with Michael Casserly, the superintendent from Miami and San Diego and all over the country. And then um, also uh, meet with our local governments, and we have a system here in Dallas where the county judge, the city manager, the head of the park, we all meet regularly, and so now we're meeting weekly uh, through Zoom or conference call. So having all of that information helps me make better decisions. The at-home learning thing, we were very fortunate that three years ago, we started a long-range facilities master plan, which was led first by a long-range technology plan. And so we had already rolled that plan out three years ago, and we were going to put devices in the hands of our students um, anyway. We were going to do, um, for all secondary students, they were going to have a Chromebook, and then for our three to five students, we we're going to ha have a different device, and then uh, we weren't really going to do anything with the primary students. We had already had all these purchased, and so we expedited. Once we saw this was going to happen, they weren't taking them home. We decided to pivot quickly the Thursday before we shut down on Friday, and we started giving those devices to every student. Um, now, unfortunately, a lot of our students don't have connect connectivity at home. Uh, it was actually smaller than what we thought. I was a coach back in the 80s when uh, nobody could afford uh, Michael Jordan, Air Jordan shoes, but every kid had them. We couldn't afford them. We found a way to get them. Same thing, almost every kid has a cell phone, but connectivity at home to this kind of situation that we need was not available. So we pivoted and we've been, our foundation has raised some money. The McDermott family gave us a uh, million dollars for the Thomas Jefferson tornado, but they quickly pivoted and allowed us to have 400,000 of those dollars to buy hotspots. Our board adopted an emergency expenditure of $2 million to get uh, more hotspots in the hands of our students so they could have connectivity. And our team has laid out a, a tremendous instructional um, program where we have high tech and low tech all at the same time. So. We've been rolling that out. We've been very pleased with the, with the early successes that we've had on that. Uh, not knowing that this crisis was coming, we were very, very proud of our people that had all those tools in place to execute on a dime. And the final thing, you know, this senior class, especially the senior class at Thomas Jefferson, who just had their school building taken away by a tornado. And now we get to this and all the rituals that we have in America um, let me make one more comment before I get to the senior class. Uh, I've been on three different groups that wanted to reinvent education. In, the six, in 2006 and seven, I was with 35 superintendents and we visioned for a year to try to reinvent education. Uh, we ran into a lot of bureaucracy and we didn't get that far. Then we, I was on another group of strange bedfellows with foundations and charters and money people and we met in Washington, D.C. We came up with a, a term called education reimagined. And not a lot has happened. The reason not, we're the only industry that has never really changed. If you go back to uh, 100 years ago, we had same Carnegie unit. We had the same thing we have today. And Xerox, every other industry has had to reinvent themselves except for us. And I argue that the reason is that all of the people who are successful now, high school work for them. Everybody who's on this call, we were all successful in high school. But a lot of these kids that I grew up with in Oak Cliff, they're a lot smarter than me. They just, high school didn't work for them. And so I think we're going to be forced in Dallas. We have to study market share very closely. Market share, we define how many kids go to charter school, home school, private school, and they don't go to our, they, they live in our district, but don't come to our school. So We've been studying market share for about five years, and either we're going to be able to capitalize on this and improve our market share by accessing more students, or we're going to lose more students because people are going to figure out that learning can go on in this time despite or in spite of us. So we have to be smart enough to do that. But for this graduating class, we're trying to pivot 
to figure out what we can do. It, it seems highly unlikely that we'll be allowed to go back to the school. If the governor's already said uh, May the 4th, well then, you know, graduation is like two, three weeks after that. And so we're, this class really, uh, we're, we're trying to work with them. We have made a decision that we're not gonna go past and have ceremonies in July or August. Our families scatter, things happen. We're gonna hold out all hope that we can do this in June, but we're also looking at some creative um, uh, solutions about how we might have graduation uh, virtually if, if it comes to that. So I'll stop there and I'm sure we'll have some questions, but those are the big buckets I wanted to lay out. Um, Dr. Hinojosa, have you been able to actually get the hot spots that you purchased? Are, are they are they in kids' hands and operational or are you still waiting on them to come in? Well, we were very fortunate. We were part of the million dollar project uh, with the distribution of a million uh, hotspots. So for many of our students, they already have them. But you make a great point. Right now, the ones that are looking for them, they're very scarce. But AT&T has stepped up big with us. And so we think we're going to be able to get to them very quickly here in the next uh, a week to, for, for the ones who don't have them already. Okay, thank you for that. Bobby, it's so good to have you with us. Bobby Blunt has been a, a trustee of the Northside District for over 20 years. Um, he's active in a variety of educational um, activities outside of that in his role, both in, in public life and in his private sector role. Um, Bobby, what have been some of the unique challenges that y'all have faced in San Antonio so far? Yeah, let me first start out by saying uh, it's, it's an honor, one, to be with Secretary Spelling and Dr. Hinojosa and listen to them. No matter what, you, I've learned a lot, and I'm sure others have too, so it really is good to be a part, part of this particular team. Uh, one other thing I want to say in advance, so I don't forget, is we, and I'm sure my other panelists agree, we definitely want to thank all the teachers and employees for the resiliencies, for the adjustments that they have made, they have been tremendous, not only in the San Antonio area, but throughout Texas and throughout our nation also. So I really want to give thanks to them. And I think we should definitely all do that. We, um, as, as you know, San Antonio, we're very collaborative in how we work together. So the information I'm going to share with you presents not only the challenges that my district, Northside ISD has, and I think many know Northside with 106,000 students that we have uh, and the different challenges that we face across the board. Uh, it's very similar that we face across San Antonio. The very first thing like Dr. Hinojosa uh, had mentioned is, you know, our very first concern was when we have to, and one, let me, let me sort of explain one thing. We're stating schools closures, but the way we're actually stating it here is the buildings are closed and maybe some of our state and federal uh, requirements from accountability have been suspended this year, but schools are fully operating. And what it demonstrates is how schools are always fully operating throughout the particular year, and this really highlights that. So one of the very first things we were responsible for schools is taking care of our food nutrition program. And as Dr. Hinojosa had stated, uh, we needed to make sure that first thing, that day that we decided that that building was going to be closed is tomorrow we had to provide both breakfast and lunch for, for our kids out there that had those particular needs. Uh, in the San Antonio area, for example, we have over, over hundreds of locations that are servicing. And each district has found the method that it needs to be able to do that. Some have buses that are driving around to different locations. Some have particular facilities. And some are actually figured out ways to do home visits for those that don't have transportation, which is always a big challenge that we're always concerned about. Uh, from what I've seen, the numbers that we have, is we served over a million meals last year, uh, last week. Think about that. And we expect this number to increase within the, uh, the, the San Antonio area. The challenge that we also had with the food service that some that Dr. Enos talked about is remember we got to prep the food, we got to get it delivered, and we got to make sure that it's received by the folks, and we got to make sure that we still honor those requirements that have been set forth by both our federal and state to make sure that we don't have people coming in crowds and other things. So it's not just a matter of providing the food, there's a lot more logistically that has to occur in that particular light. Another big need that we found across the board with our community is that focus of mental health. And what I mean by that, we know that our students and others are going to need access to counselors. They're going to need access to be able to converse to others. So all of our districts across the board have found methods better to do that. Online methods, phone call methods, counselors are available. Counselors are able to provide those services to the students and the community, especially at this particular time of need that we have with getting out information. The technology piece has been, without a doubt, a challenge for every single one of us. In addition to finding ways to be able to get, get hotspots out uh, that are needed, providing Wi-Fi access that are closer to our campuses and other things, 
Another key element that we have to remember as we provide distant learning is we have that challenge of making sure that the inequities that may exist today, that we don't make that broader. And when you have these type of situations, that is always a big, big concern, uh, without a doubt. Give me a quick example. I can go online and provide a course for a particular student group. But what I've got to remember that a teacher also has is a teacher may have a student that is just a newcomer to this country that's coming in from a country that we may not be familiar with. It could be Nepal, it could be Pakistan, and other type things. Those are the type of things that are concerned of in providing that type of services. How do we ensure they can get that one-on-one -on -one that that particular student requires? Same thing when we talk about our special education students. We go through a number of uh, processes and challenges to make sure that we have their individual plans prepared. How do we take care of that in this particular environment is a challenge. So in addition to providing online and some other type of access, what we realize is we're starting to uh, lose a little bit of that personal type touch that's required in that one-on-one -on -one type thing for a certain type of our student groups. So that's something else that we've been dealing with and, and, and trying to make sure that we take care of. In addition, we got to remember, we've got two of us that are school board members. Uh, a big change for us also. We've got to continue to govern. And how do we do that? We can't go back over to our central offices and other locations. So we've gotten used to acting or doing like we are now, doing things remotely. But it's not that similar because we have requirements like the Open Meetings Act. So we can make sure that all of our population, all of our citizens are able to also get into particular meetings uh, that we're having across the board. Uh, one of the uh, other immediate things that we had to take care of as part of our governance role that I'm very proud that we did in the San Antonio area as well as other districts is we all just about made a decision that we're going to make sure all of our employees are paid that we're going to continue everybody on the payroll and we have the whole special meetings to give the superintendent the power or different methods of being able to ensure that that occurred too and there's other governance type things that we've got to keep going also to make sure that our school system continues to fully operate one other thing we're doing sort of unique in the uh, san antonio area that now other districts are adopting is we see ourselves extremely valuable to the community and i know dallas has done the same thing in some of the other areas too so we're also realizing the supplies that our nurses have and our other medical um, uh, individuals that support those type of needs are providing PPE directly to the hospitals. So we know there's a direct need for masks, a direct need for thermometers and other type of equipment. We got a call actually from one of our local hospitals to say, can you help us out? And we stood up and said, yes, we can. Not just my district, but other surrounding districts also. So us being a key part of the community, without a doubt, is another challenge uh, that, we, that we face across the board that we, we want to deal with. And the last one that I had, and I'll go back to my beginning statement, is you know, we just want to make sure that we're providing that full support to the teachers as they go through this new process of giving out distance and also remote, remote learning also, and to make sure that in advance that whatever else that they need to be able to supply that, both take care of those personally and also having the tools to take care of the students and we continue to make sure that that functions correctly also. Bobby, I appreciate you mentioning um, when we're talking about um, students with, with special needs, with additional needs. Um, obviously, we, we justifiably talk about socioeconomically disadvantaged students a lot. We talk about English language learners a lot. But the special ed, in terms of uh, kiddos that have a 504 plan, or that are otherwise taking advantage of special education services pose a really special challenge in these times because the delivery of instruction um, in this remote format is, it seems especially challenging in, in that population that can't be solved with a new Chromebook and a hotspot. Um, Dr. Hinojosa, has DISD wrestled with any of these issues and if so, do you have any great insight for us? Well, no great insight, because that is a huge challenge. And Secretary Spellings will know, it, early on it was very challenging because the federal government was very flexible with us on almost everything, except- Except special ed. ed. But yep. Because they had uh, no authority to give us flexibility. However, as this crisis has evolved, there has been some that has been granted and uh, we're, we're working with them um, our, we've also been, special ed was our, our, our biggest Achilles heel in our district and recently we've been making a lot of changes in special ed and I'm very proud of the new team that we have in there and they have been able to get things out to our families and but right now on the conference call with the other superintendents today, you know, people were really begging each other to work on relationships while we get, while we're in this um, 
transitional period about how we have flexibility and how we provide services that really everybody needs to be empathetic and people need to go above and beyond. And in fact, we've had stories where some of the parents actually like this Zoom opportunity to have a conversation about their student with special needs. So just like you said, every, you know, uh, uh, everybody steps up in a crisis and we've had people do this and it is still uh, one of our biggest challenges in special ed, but I think we're working together with our families and our educators to try to manage this thing. Uh, Secretary Spellings, I'd be really interested to hear your take on that subject in particular. You've seen this from both the state and the federal side, and I know it's an issue that's near and dear to you. Yeah, and it's uh, one that's really confounding superintendents and school districts and policymakers all over the country. And there's a little bit of a, if I can, you know, since we're in a closed event here, a little bit of an undercurrent that says, <clears throat> if we can't do for everybody, we shouldn't do for anybody. And I know, Michael, you probably have run into that a little bit too. And you said it, Zach, yesterday, buckets of grace. I mean, we're all doing the best we can under very difficult uh, circumstances. But of course, uh, school districts and, and not uh, wrongly, you know, often worry about litigation and exposure and those sorts of things. So one of the things that I'm seeing, and I think it's important, is how we deploy our human resources, our teachers, our educators, our counselors, our administrators in times like this. And what I've seen uh, some models, some innovators around the country doing is having a single teacher, for example, teach the entire fourth grade math so that a teacher could be freed to work only with all the special ed students and their families in a one-on-one, -on -one, more intensive sort of way. So I think we're, we're trying to, we're gonna need to think about how we deploy our grown-ups around uh, challenges like this. And we're gonna have to think in advance about what will we do when, because I think what I'm also hearing around the country, and you are too, is that this is not a one-off. We are likely to be it back in school for a while, potentially in the early to mid-summer, maybe even summer school. Uh, there's some discussion about that, I know, at the state level. And then potentially out again when the COVID variant roars back in the fall. And, we'll, uh, and so, you know, who knows? And so I think uh, we need to be prepared. What will we do when uh, the next event like this happens? And we'll be better prepared. The other Thank thing I, you very much. Is yes. that, that I found in my time, uh, you know, this is a communicate, communicate, communicate kind of environment. And working with the advocacy groups, the special ed groups in Washington, uh, I certainly did a lot of that when I was secretary. I don't know uh, what Secretary DeVos's relationship is with those folks, but uh, those advocacy organizations can be helpful. And I think around the country, I've seen some pockets where they get it. Uh, they understand what's going on here. They don't want their kids to lose ground, but they understand that that uh, we need to, we're going to need to do some things differently. Well, thank you not only for those comments, but for reminding me of one of my very simple duties that I neglected to mention at the beginning of our conversation. Um, just as a, as a gentle reminder to our participants and attendees, this is a meeting for Lyceum directors, alumni, and friends. And our conversation and comments today are strictly off the record. So all of you guys out there in Zoom land that know how to record this stuff, go ahead and delete it. And, uh, and we'll, we'll keep on going forward. I want to turn to a couple of questions um, that we received in advance. Um, and, and one of those is about promotion um, from one grade to the next for the next year and also um, getting kids caught up academically. I mean, we all are slide and uh, this year it looks like it's going to be a much more pronounced effect. Obviously, I think all of us realize that distance ed that put together on a short notice is going to be tough to get everything covered that we need to. Um, and uh, there's thoughts that, you know, promotion from one grade to the next will be handled primarily on a local level. Um, Bobby, how thrilled are you about that, that the state decided that that's a decision that local districts can make on their own? Well, you asked that question, I think you just can't. 
<laughs> but, <laughs> but we honestly, we sort of, we sort of welcome that. Um, yeah, I'd give one opinion. Yeah, I, I think it is. I, I think it is a local decision to be honest. Uh, to allow each uh, of, the, of the boards, the districts, and the superintendents to figure out how they're going to work out the promotions. Uh, remember, we're still, again, we're still operating. I mean, the kids are still learning today. We're, we're working through the distant learning and other components. So in the end, we've got to rely on the teachers and have the trust that they're going to do the best they can to make sure that that continues and let them have that decision making on this student is ready or this student is not ready. You know, there's one other thing that I'm, I'm really concerned about, too, that, remember, it's more than just academics. Uh, the extracurricular activities that we have are extremely critical. The number of different clubs, that are, uh, chess type clubs and these other activities, the mentorship type aspect, those are the things that we're losing out too that we'll have to figure out how we regain later uh, also. But I'll let some of the other panelists speak to it also. Um, Dr. Hinojosa is DISD giving um, numerical grades, letter grades during this time or are you adopting more of a pass-fail approach for work um, after spring break. How'd you get into my staff meeting? I thought this stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, we're talking about all those things as we on the fly. I do want to thank though the commissioner, um, and they're giving us flexibility. We need it at this time. And every situation is different. And basically, it's not the student's fault and it's not the teacher's fault. So we have to have maximum flexibility on how we handle things. Um, my son is a law student at the University of Texas, um, and of course, they, he's been notified that for the rest of the year, all the grades for the spring semester are going to be pass-fail. We, um, we are using the pass-fail option for our class rank, and we're kind of freezing where we were when we went into this, because it's a whole new period. So we're not going to penalize anybody for, on that. We're still having conversations about actual grades for everybody else. And there's a, a lot of debate. We do have the opportunity at staff level to uh, look at, because it's in regulation and not policy. So we're looking at how do we weigh all considerations? We have groups of principals and teachers that are weighing in on this. And so bottom line, we're gonna take almost like uh, every individual student and make sure they don't get harmed. And if they have a way to catch up, that's something that we'll consider if they were failing and now they can do something to sh show that they're mastering the content, and then we can help them get caught up. So uh, it, it is going to be handled on a case-by-case -case going forward in the, in the end. We have not landed on numeric grades or not for the all of grades, but for class rank, we have frozen that uh, and, and for future years because that comes you know, to get into the University of Texas or Texas A&M, those are high stakes. And so there are a lot of things that we have to consider there. So that's kind of where we are at this point. Zach, I want to weigh in on this and be the- Secretary, the, yes. Yeah, uh, the resident was, yeah, please. Obviously it was the right call not to have any standardized testing this year. And going forward, we're gonna to need to make sure that assessments are better embedded into technology and the self-paced kind of learning that's going on and have that, that immediate feedback that can not only give teachers a lot of signals, but also be valid and reliable and comparable and useful for policy purposes. I mean, our legislature just passed a bill that rewards schools and rewards school districts and rewards teachers. And one of the components is our STAR test, a valid, reliable, comparable, psychometrically sound uh, instrument and that doesn't exist at the moment. So I want to put out to everybody in TV land that we'll need to stand back for those things when we can next year because it's valuable, valuable data. Now, first point. Second point is one of the things that, that we're learning at Texas 2036 and as I look around the country, and of course, teacher grades are not necessarily designed for this purpose in, in, you know, in the front end. But we are finding that those teacher grades are quite predictive about success. And in the short run, they'll, they're gonna do the job. But when we start talking about college admissions and class rank and comparable this, that, and the other thing, we gotta go back to those psychometrically sound uh, instruments that uh, many of us have come to, to love, the data geeks. But thank you for that, and uh, thanks for uh, all of you for those points. Um, and I want to thank Jordan Anderson for submitting that line of questioning beforehand. 
Um, I've got a question from Joseph Cosper that, Bobby, I'd like to begin um, sending your way. This is perhaps not a policy item for school boards, but it's certainly something for all of us to think about as we think about teacher evaluation. And that is, what's a fair way to account for teachers um, who simply don't have the digital literacy um, required to teach online and that perhaps that was not a, a key skill for them to have beforehand. And, uh, and we've got a lot of uh, uptake on the educator side to do. I know there's an awful lot of effort being put in. Nobody questions the effort. But, but how do we account for folks that don't have the same level of digital background? Yeah, I guess I'll start out by saying one of the, one of the things we've got to do is learn from in other words, I think the key is always professional de development. So during this crisis, this emergency situation right now, I don't think anybody should be punished as a result of some skill that they haven't obtained at this particular time. I think the very first thing we're going to have to do as soon as we can is, hey, look, from a professional development sense, we're going to have to make sure that all of us are prepared. And as we recruit and otherwise um, uh, continue to retain our teachers to say this is a necessary skill and this is why. So we treat it as more or less of, as a lesson learned. So I'll, in the end, I'll let my superintendent, uh, Dr. Woods, sort of make that final decision when it comes to the evaluation and other things. But just since, since it's off the records, you know, I, I don't see how we can hold it against, but just encourage uh, from a growth sense. Dr. Hinojosa. Well, I think it's imperative. This is a new world, this is a new reality. Um, and we're gonna have to make some tough decisions. And um, a lot of people were opposed, including me. I was skeptical about our pay for performance in Dallas. So. Really, effort is good, but results are better. If you get the results for these students and uh, the technology now is gonna, obviously, this is gonna change our world. It's gonna change our, our suppliers. It's gonna change how everybody does business. And the people who sit around and whine about it are gonna get blown away. And the people who are in and, uh, and, and the people who come up with new ideas, those are the ones that are gonna be successful and you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to threaten anybody, but I'd, I'd love to have students from Northside or Lubbock in, enroll in Dallas ISD if you got So that's the attitude we got to have is we got to deliver this in this new era because if we don't, somebody else is. And so we have to reinvent ourselves as we're going. Never waste a good crisis. Here's our opportunity to do things better for students. The kids already get the technology. I mean, you know, I remember when we first started training teachers back in the early 2000s when I was superintendent in Hayes, and we said, well, we can't deliver this technology until all the teachers get trained and the kids already knew how to use it. Remember, those kids are now our, our young teachers. Those millennials are the ones that it's second nature to them. So this is going to be a necessary requirement whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. One thing I'd like to focus on, and, and uh, Secretary Spellings, let's talk to you. One thing a lot of us have talked about more lately is um, CTE and uh, career, re career ready work-based learning, um, high school diploma plus type stuff. What, what kind of uh, inventiveness have we seen so far in terms of businesses or community colleges pivoting to uh, engage students virtually along those lines? Well, I, I personally believe that we need to basically turn every high school into a community college. And that is to say that every single student has the opportunity to get that uh, credential at, at, their, at their high school, that we need to stop talking so much about the FAFSA and start talking about how we're gonna bring Mohammed to the mountain and bring that kind of capacity into our high schools. And I think it will be an imperative. Uh, obviously the oil and gas industry is in peril our Texas economy will be in peril. Uh, we will have the opportunity and challenge to retool this workforce uh, around new things. Uh, healthcare, clearly, uh, manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, and the demand, the tilt, and the shift in the workforce is going to be huge and quite acute. And so, yes, we'll have to adapt online learning for those sorts of settings as well. There's already a lot of that going on. Michael can speak to the partnerships they have with Dallas County Community College, but it's still in relative terms in its infancy. Uh, we have, you know, single digit numbers of schools in this community that do that sort of thing, but we need to make it ubiquitous. We need to fund it just as we have done with advanced placement and IB and, and things like that. I mean, at the high end, 
kids can get a lot of college level uh, schooling at their high school, but we have failed to do that uh, in the skills and the, and the technology-based and STEM-based fields that our economy demands now. Exactly. Bobby, one thing, go ahead, Mark. Uh, let me let you go to Bobby and I'll hold my thought. Bobby, one thing that I've always really admired about Northside is the phenomenal job that your district has done in providing agriculturally based career and technology education in a relatively urban environment. And talk a little bit about some of the challenges, so much of that's hands-on kind of stuff. So talk about some of the challenges that Northside faces going forward as you try to continue that legacy. Well, well actually, um, and I'll make it a little bit broader than that, and you're correct on that particular program, is uh, one thing is remember Northside's urban, suburban, everything possibly. So that's one, one thing uh, to understand my particular district. But what we've actually done related to the question and the topic is initially we established uh, magnet tech school type programs, schools within schools, et cetera. Agriculture being one, healthcare being another, uh, business careers being another one that we, in our science and engineering academy. But what we've done the last two years is to realize, certainly what the Secretary Spelling is talking about, is how do we get this out to all our campuses? Magnet schools, it's for an area, transportation, some other things, but we need us to be at every single school. And that's the approach we've taken now. And we've actually done that with cybersecurity. So we've actually worked with the University of Texas San Antonio, I know Dr. Nelson will give an example also, where um, we've actually had our teachers that are being trained in cybersecurity also with the community and they are working with the different high school teachers to provide that particular, um, that particular one as a academy type program for the different high schools. So then we begin to spread that out across the board. We are also are making that a virtual type uh, situation because that lends that, that particular way for that particular topic and are gonna offer it to not only for the schools that are here in the north side, but it's gonna be offered for others throughout the state of Texas, et cetera, say here's a virtual based curriculum that you can use to teach in cybersecurity, et cetera. So we continue in that particular vein, and uh, we just get very big community support for it, uh, be, able to be able to offer these type of programs, and we're gonna to continue to do so. But that's sort of where we, uh, where we currently stand with it. And, it. and it's a big goal of our, of our board also, which is extremely critical. Thank you, Bobby. Dr. Hinojosa. Yeah, well, a couple of things on that. You know, we, we started down that journey. In Dallas ISD, we have a P-TECH, or Pathway in Technology, at every high school in town where you can get your associate's degree while you're graduating from high school. We started this journey uh, four years ago. Only 15% of our kids ever went to any kind of post-secondary credential six years after graduating. Next year, we'll have 15% of our kids graduating from high school with an associate's degree paired with industry partners. We have 77 industry partners like American Airlines. To your point, Zach, American Airlines said, they came with us at community college and they said, look at the equipment you're training your kids on. They're not going to be able to get a job. So American Airlines came in at that campus and, and with the support of the community college, took out all the old antiquated equipment and now our kids are learning on that equipment. And so um, we're, we're making sure we have 10,000 rising freshmen. 6,000 of them apply to go to these P-TECH programs and we can only accept half of them because of capacity constraints. And then, so we started a new program called, uh, the new program that, that we're gonna take all of our other kids who don't get in, and we're gonna train them on cybersecurity, we're gonna train them on mechatronics, we're gonna train them on logistics, and those are called career institutes, and we're putting that throughout the city. So our kids are gonna have a living wage when they walk out of high school, and if they choose, I think the top quarter is gonna to go to college in spite of us. So now we pulled up the P-TECH in the second quarter where they can get something. And then our third and fourth quarter kids through our career institutes will also have an opportunity for a high wage job. But you're exactly right, that equipment is so important. And in fact, one of the glitches we've had here, we had the Chromebooks for our P-TECH students. And now during this phase down, we decided, no, no, they gotta have a full strength PC. So we swapped them out and gave them PCs and then uh, using the Chromebooks for our third through fifth grade. Dr. Hinojosa, let me, you know, go, go ahead, Bobby. Yeah, sorry, let me bring up one other uh, critical point also related to the subject matter, because a lot of times we talk about high school, we're doing the same thing with our middle school. So we're beginning to open up those type of programs there. But to me, the really big numbers are coming from elementary school. So now we're beginning to find methods to introduce STEM 
in, in, in cybersecurity and other areas, coding and et cetera, through elementary schools also, because we think that's going to be the key to really build up the big numbers that we need within the state of Texas to really have a big impact. But you know, the other thing that I think is going to be important for us to all really think about, and Michael, you mentioned American Airlines. Well, American Airlines is on their back, obviously. And so how do we think about not only the workforce for getting around this recession, but what will it be 10 years from now? And how are we going to tool our schools to, to, to the, those jobs that we don't I even agree. know about? I agree wholeheartedly with you. And that's why I'm on a big kick of, that's why you push the elementary schools, because yeah, that's exactly. what you're talking about and let them be creative. Think of it. Yeah. Dr. Hinojosa, I want to um, zoom in on a very uh, kind of close to the ground um, bread and butter issue. We've talked a little bit about Wi-Fi in terms of trying to bring that out into the community. I think a lot of folks know that uh, paper packets are being distributed to elementary school students in a variety of ways across the state. But what about attendance? Um, I think a lot of folks, regardless of whether they're going to go uh, pass, fail, or take a letter grades, are still focused on attendance and participation and check-ins, for lack of a better term. And, and how are we going to handle that for kiddos that do not have the ability to check in virtually? Yeah, and one, thing, one of the things that I was worried about is because one of the conference calls that I was on, a superintendent said they had not gotten in touch with 10,000 of their kids in their large urban district. Another one said that they can't find a lot of their kids. I was, so I went, I got scared. I went back and started checking with my staff. And I was very pleased that we have made contact with 152,280 students, 98.8% of our kids. We have found a way to connect to them. And we're only missing, you know, less than a thousand kids that we have not made a connection to. We expect our teachers, as part of their daily contacts, to take some form of attendance. And these kids, if they're there by themselves all the time, they need to have some kind of contact, whether it's through a phone, phone call, an email, whatever we can get to them. And so we're putting protocols in place to have that high touch in addition to how we're kind of in this situation. And we've also have uh, an expectation of all of our counselors to go through and make some kind of contact with every student that's assigned to them once a week. And so we're figuring this out as we go, but early numbers, I'm very pleased in the rough urban environment that we have, that we've had that kind of connectivity with our students this quickly. Uh, it gave me a big sigh of relief, Zach, when that question came up from other people and then I had to go do some digging on my own. Thank you for that. Michael, I think I mentioned yesterday that they're missing 40,000 kids in LA Unified. Um, unbelievable. unbelievable. Um, Secretary Spellings, while you're there, talk a little bit about some of the inventive practices that you've seen or visited with colleagues about in terms of getting connectivity out into the community and using that both to deliver content and to check in on kids. Yeah, a couple of examples. Uh, uh, South Carolina have, has deployed all of their school buses or lots of their school buses to go and take hot spots out into the community. Uh, that's being copycatted around, uh, around the country some. And I will give an example about North Carolina, and, and this is a sleeper of an issue, but governance and what I call being organized for success, the way we're structured, the, the, uh, the communication or lack of between our levels of government and uh, the community college to the, to the school district and whatnot. And at, at uh, the University of North Carolina system that I've ran for a while, uh, we oversaw the entire public television system for the state, and it was a singular system. It wasn't a bunch of stations all governed independently. They had advisory boards, but they also, we proffered a curriculum that was tied to the state standards, and now through their public broadcasting system, they are sending out programming, you know, uh, all day, every day, using the television much more universally available often, especially in poor and rural communities, than these high tech things. So that's a governance issue. I mean, how do we think about public broadcasting? Should we have that kind of capacity or whatever? But those are a couple of examples of what I've seen around the country. Great. I really appreciate that. 
Um, Bobby, what sort of things are you seeing in your community that are inspiring your teachers, inspiring um, board members and administrators to to get to keep going in these challenging times? I know there's a lot of those stories around the state. Yeah, you know, the one I, I've seen here and I've seen other places too, definitely bring a smile to my face, is when the teachers started having parades in their neighborhoods. And they started driving around and uh, wave and, and let everybody know in advance. So the kids and all the kids were lined up properly with their proper spacing with their families and just waving and watching them cheering those teachers on. And that was something else to see. And that definitely inspired the community as well as those teachers and those kids also. So I'd love to see those type of things. The other ones I've seen is um, uh, the teachers that have been posting at the campuses uh, saying, we miss you students and uh, we, we can't wait to have you back. So those, those things I think are really great. And, and the last one I'll bring up to allow my panelists some more examples is um, I've seen uh, some students that have actually are making masks and they're making those to help out uh, our hospitals and others. And uh, that, that's great to see also. Dr. Hinojosa, you've been around um, public education and public education policy in Texas for a long time. And those public education policy discussions tend to always uh, end up at the subject of school finance. What um, issues do you see on the school finance horizon for the 2021 session, given this, the impact of this situation, not only on schools, but also on the state treasury? Yeah, and I've been around, I've sued the state five times, and uh, I won most of those. The last one, though, they said we couldn't do this. And I was so encouraged with House Bill 3 because it was really a game changer and it, it was bipartisan, it was bicameral, and everybody rallied behind it. And we finally had some real substantive new money along with some innovation pushed in there. And that is what is really um, the kind of the shame in all of this situation is because now you look at all revenues and you look at sales tax revenues and the state's going to be hurting big time. We're all going to be okay for this year and the second year of the biennium, we're going to be okay. But going forward, uh, I don't really know uh, how we can sustain what we have. And so the biggest thing is going to be is, is, is how we all pitch in. But, you know, the state of Texas is resilient. We, we were the last into the recession and the first out. If you look at the numbers right now, the state of New York has more positive cases than every country in the world except for um, Spain and Italy. Uh, and so Texas numbers are far lower than that. So I'm hoping that if we just listen to the health officials and we listen to our elected officials and our leaders and we just manage to keep a handle on this as much as we can, and then if we're poised to bounce back more quickly than others, just like we did on the recession in 08 and 09, et cetera, so I think there are many huge implications. It's too early to tell. But I think, you know, I was very involved in, in uh, uh, the last legislative session, as I have been every time, and I will be involved this time, too. So part of it, we're going to play defense, and part of it, we're going to play offense. And so how do we figure that out? The next few months is going to be critically important. Margaret, were you a defendant in any of those lawsuits? <laughs> not not at the state level, no. <laughs> uh, you know, well, I, tell I, us I, your I, take on the next session. Yeah, please. I just want to echo what Michael is saying. And, you know, it, it's going to be a rough, rough session. We're going to be competing, obviously, with, with health folks and resiliency. People, I don't think, are going to be too worried about congestion, uh, things like that. But, you know, what's happening in the next few weeks and months, we are proving up our worthiness for investment right now. And that's why what we're doing is so critical and why, you know, things like, uh, you know, assessment and grading policies and staying tough and doing right by kids and teachers is, you know, gonna set us on a course for either hitting pause permanently and really retreating on the reforms of House Bill 3 or uh, allowing us to have those investments made. And so it, it, we're gonna need all of us down there in Austin talking the talking it up what if i want to close with with each of you on a couple of points and that is 
number one, we've got a lot of people um, on this conference who in their hearts are friends of public education and always want to know new ways that they can support public education in times like these. And so I'd like to hear you talk about that and also just briefly the, uh, the role that all this forced homeschooling is going to have for folks' uh, perception of the profession of education. And uh, Secretary Spellings, let's start with you. Well, I think uh, th that's a great point that you just made at the end there and, and uh, you know, to medium speed pitch over the plate. And that is people are appreciating their schools more than ever. I mean, they get that it's hard and it's complicated and there's a lot more than just learning that goes on in our schools and they're vital institutions for our uh, communities. And yes, can we improve and modernize and do things differently? Do we need broadband? Do we need better trained uh, staff when it comes to using technology? Yes, yes, yes. But um, I, I think if people appreciate their schools now more than ever. We're going to have to get organized for success. Uh, there's still a lot of slippage, a lot of unevenness, and we need to do that between higher ed and K-12 and within our K-12 system because we've got everybody sort of doing their own thing. Um, Michael, you've seen it a lot. We've In Collin County up here, we've had kind of an outlier sort of approach and so anyway, we, we're going to probably have some ways where we're going to have to centralize policy a little more than we have in times past to really address what's before us. Dr. Hinojosa, briefly, please, sir. Yeah, I'm so proud that I was a member of the Lyceum, and there were a lot of smart people there. And the big thing that the Lyceum teaches you is to be engaged and be present and show up. And that's what I love about it. So continue to do that in your local communities and also with us nationally, uh, us with the whole state. Um, also, I would add that, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And I think that we will come out of this stronger if we have the right attitude. I think that how we approach this crisis and the recovery from the crisis will be critical. But I, I'm excited about it. It's, I'm 63 years old and I hope, you know, I've, I've ordered a pine box from my conference room. Hopefully I'll never have to retire. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby, I'd like to hear your closing comments. I'll give you the last word on the perception of the profession in the public. Uh, and I guess so like it was just stated previously, uh, I think everybody realized the value that public education has within our community and the important things that it served in addition to the uh, diffusion of knowledge that our constitution wants us to be able to provide, but also in terms of taking care of those kids, taking care of those families, et cetera. And the growth of our state is gonna be dependent on that. So. The main thing that we really need also from everybody is somebody, whoever you are, you have an idea to help, help out of school. I don't care what it is, there's something you can do to help out. In addition, make sure you pass on those thank you to those teachers and those employees and throw in a superintendent or two also. <laughs> thank you so much. I want to thank all of our panelists for joining me today. Panelists, you can't see our audience, but I can assure you they are all clapping for you. It's been such an honor to, uh, to be with you today. Um, Margaret gave me credit for a saying that is not mine to claim. I'm very fortunate to work with a great superintendent and Dr. Kathy Rolo, who has said often that we've got to give each other buckets of grace in time like in times like this. And I would encourage all of us to find places in our daily lives to be able to do that to others in these unprecedented times, to reach out to our fellow citizens and give those buckets of grace and uh, fulfill the very best traditions of what it means to be Texans and Americans. Thank you for joining us, and we wish you all very good health in the days to come. Thanks, Zach. Thank you all. Thank you.